Okay. Hey, welcome everybody. Grab a seat if you can. There's more chairs over here. Hi. We're just, uh, those who are live streaming, we're just getting situated here and settled, so give us a minute. How are you guys doing today? It's great turnout. Thank you for coming tonight. Thanks. Thanks for the help. Uh, well, welcome to this night of cultural training. Um, I kind of was figuring out today, I have never in my life, I don't think, met anybody from Afghanistan. I've met people from countries all over the world, but th this is my first night to meet friends from Afghanistan. So like, I need the cultural training. I don't know about the rest of you. I uh, want to welcome all of our partners from the Methodist Church. Could you guys just give us a wave and yeah, great. We are so glad to be partnering with you. Dave, oh, it's okay. and uh, I'm great, great friends with your pastor, Steve Kramer. I think the world of that guy. Um, uh, before we do anything else, I want to thank our point person and leader, John Pullman. John, if you'd stand up, and you are standing up, okay. Yeah. But uh, we had a leadership team, but we were looking for someone to be the point guard on the team, and uh, I really felt like it was John. And John felt the call of Christ on his heart, and he responded, and we drank a cup of coffee. But he's, by profession, he's been a police officer, an assistant police chief in Blue Ash. He's been a pastor for many years of a church. Uh, he raises alpacas and plays the drums, I found out this week. Really good drummer. So, but John, thank you for uh, hearing Christ's call to lead this effort. Um, I want to speak re real briefly. We're going to get into the training very soon. John's going to speak. But um, briefly, like you might ask, why are we doing this? Uh, why are we getting involved with Afghan refugees? Well, the reason we do anything in the church is because Christ has called us to do it and commanded us to do it. Amen? <laughs> this is the reason we do anything. Um, I'm remembering 30 years ago, people used to wear these bracelets that said WWJD. Remember those? Everybody was wearing them. Uh, what would Jesus do? There's times like you wonder what would Jesus do. There's times you got to pray about that, but other times the call of Christ, his command is clear. And his command to help people in trauma, to help the needy, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, uh, that could not be more clear in the Gospels. I especially think of Matthew 25, right before Jesus went to the cross. Some of the last words he ever taught is, he said to his disciples, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. That stranger that you welcomed, that was me. <laughs> so anyway, the call of Christ in this case is very, very clear. I think of the Good Samaritan. You all know the story. It was a shocking story when Jesus told it. Guy is beaten up by robbers, ambushed, left for dead, brutalized. And who passes by? A priest. In other words, a senior pastor. <laughs> very religious, but he passes by. Don't want to get involved. Next to Levite, very religious person who served in the temple. Don't want to get involved, passes by. And finally, a Samaritan. These people that were the heretics and the outcasts and the people hated the Samaritans. It's the Samaritan who stops and helps the man. And Jesus ends that parable. He says, who do you think was the neighbor to that man who was needed help? Everyone says, well, it, it was the Samaritan. So for me, I hope for you as Christians, like the call of Christ our Lord could not be more clear. Um, so... I don't have to convince you. I don't have to persuade you. This is the Lord's work we're doing. Um, it's a huge undertaking. Um, how quickly, just in a matter of weeks, God has mobilized people and resources and skills and talents and put us in touch with the Afghan community. It's been amazing. I, I would say almost supernatural. Um, so I want to next just introduce John. He's going to say a few introductory words, and then we'll get to our training. John, come on up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. 
Well, let's just open with a word of prayer, can we? Sure. Lord, we thank you for the chance to gather. We thank you for every person who's here tonight and those who are joining us by live streaming. And Lord, just teach us tonight how to welcome uh, these neighbors from Afghanistan, how to be good neighbors to them. Thank you for our guest speakers, Lord, their willingness to help us and be here tonight. We are so grateful for them. And it's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. Salam alaikum. My friends there, uh, we use that quote. Sharon and I have been in Jordan, Israel a lot, uh, so it wasn't foreign, but we wanted to welcome our friends from Afghanistan with that. Um, I, I would like to just go through uh, very quickly uh, an overview for you so you know where we are right now and where we've been and where we might go because we don't really know some things yet. Uh, this has all come together very, very quickly. Um, and I'll, sh I'll tell you a couple ways to keep in touch as well so you know what's going on. But uh, Faridun uh, Wahid uh, is here. Uh, Faridun is uh, in the blue shirt. Uh, he is the president of the Afghan American uh, Association of Cincinnati. And uh, uh, the, um, uh, I'm trying to think of his name again, from the United Methodist Church, met uh, Shafak. And that's how we connected. We were a couple weeks into the project before we even met. Is Dave here? Oh, Dave, okay. I haven't met Dave in person yet. Okay. I have been talking with people on Zoom and everything else, so I'm glad you're here. Okay, but thanks for that connection because that's really helped us out. And uh, Shafak, uh, Hassan, uh, I feel like we've really become close friends already. We have met for coffee in every coffee shop in Lebanon now. And... Uh, We've been, really, we have been. We've been all over. And uh, we, we've become good friends. I think we've got a good thing going. And uh, uh, he's on the board of, of the association. But they are going to be really key to help us through this process. And without them, I had a lot of concerns. And I'm very much at ease in, in some ways because of their help. Their association will be able to help us integrate our new neighbors, so much easier than we could alone. Uh, but we have no idea if we will have English speakers or not at this point. So I'll, I'll fill you in real quick. Uh, well, here's our team leaders, and I'd like to thank them. A couple of them are here today. Anne LaRoe is here. Uh, she's taking care of the, kind of like the health, uh, what we call, uh, what we call the use of professional, professional services. services. And, uh, oh, there it is there, okay. And uh, Jordan. Uh, is right here. He's going to be taking care of a lot of the kind of the details of Social Security and he's got the utilities hooked up for the apartments and a lot of just kind of jumping around things really. Yeah. And uh, Rachel is here, uh, his fiance, and they're doing this in the process of they're getting married in just what, how many days now? 82 days. And they're doing this. I don't know if I'd be doing this then. You know, it's crazy. Rachel's doing communications for us, and she's setting up all of our links and uh, logging and all of that. So there's a whole lot to that, but thanks for doing that. And uh, did I miss anybody? That's, I know the rest of them are online tonight because they had some things they were doing. So those are our team leaders, and, uh, and I'll tell you about how to get a hold of them because we need help. And, and it's... Uh, we're putting the call out starting tonight. So here's a little bit of the timeline of what we've done so far. I'll get out of the way so the folks, are, can you see me still? Okay. Um, we had a meeting on December 14th. Peter called and said, hey, John, come to the meeting. And Christy Hall was there. She was working with Sparrow's Purse, and she's connected here in town. Uh, she grew up here, and she's now working with Sparrow's Purse and lives in Columbus. And at the time, we were just like, we, had, we knew nothing in December. So we had a couple of meetings, and things happened really quick. And by the time the January 14th came along, a month later, we had our team in place. I mean, this really, this is something that normally would take months to do. 
uh, we did a, a readiness interview. Uh, we are working with Samaritan's Purse. And if you're not familiar with them, Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham, is the president of Samaritan's Purse, and it's a worldwide uh, relief agency. And they do a lot of different things. I have worked with them uh, when I was doing mission work. And it's a wonderful organization, but they are heading this. Uh, they're kind of our connection between the State Department and us. So we report to Samaritan's Purse on everything we're doing, and we're going the way they have it organized. So we had our interview January 19th, and we passed. I had one question. He says, that's totally unusual. So it has been sent to the State Department, and Wednesday, uh, in two days, we should know, maybe. This whole thing has been a maybe. Every time we turn around, something changes. So Wednesday, we should know, maybe, I always say, what, what uh, makeup of families we would have. We've, we have asked for two families, but we don't know who we're going to get. We don't know if they speak English. We don't know if they're farmers or doctors or, or what. We have no idea. They try to match uh, their uh, new neighbors with what we have and our neighbor here. And, and our friends here from the Afghan American Association have helped because they are kind of connected and know how they operate and what they can do for us in, in connecting that. So I hope to make an announcement. And then the new families could arrive within days or a week. It'll happen very fast. Uh, then we'll go through a 90-day orientation to begin integration. One word you want to stay away from is assimilation. We're not assimilating our new friends into the society. And even my uh, ancestors that came here from Germany not long ago, and all, a lot of you, um, you know, we always talked about assimilation. Well, it's integration. You know, they'll still have their culture. You know, we still have our German culture. We do German stuff all the time. But we still, we're Americans. And that's the way our friends feel here. They feel like they're Americans, but they have that Afghan culture. So, you know, if you ever have contact, think about that. It's, a, it's not an assimilation, it's an integration. That's a really important word that we're using. So 90 days, we are responsible for our new families. Now, we're not going to abandon them after 90 days, but that's an obligation. We think that a, about a year it'll take. I think really with you guys, it's going to be quicker. Thank goodness. Um, and then we'd like you to get involved. And I know we've been talking about this and you've seen things, but um, Courtney, uh, Courtney Williams is head of our housing and transportation. She has by far the biggest hunk of this. She needs help. So, and I, did, I didn't get the link, Rachel. Do we have the Sign Up Genius link? Um, so Courtney sent me uh, the um, I actual list of items this morning. I was working today, so I haven't had a Well, I know, yet. yeah. <laughs> Some of us have to work for a living, right? I know. <laughs> yeah, I, and I do appreciate our team leaders because of that. They're working. And that's why I pick on Jordan all the time, because he's at home right now. So... Um, anyway, we will put that out soon. That will be a detailed list of all the household items that we need. We need to furnish our two apartments. We have two apartments in the city limits now. We've paid the rent and the lease, and we've got it all ready. Uh, but Courtney's going to need help with furniture. And we don't want a bunch of junk to show up. She's got, like, I need a toaster and a, a, a butter knife and, you know, whatever. She's, she's got a list of what she actually needs. So we'll have to furnish two total apartments. Uh, give financially. Uh, we, we've got a lot of expenses at first. We've got utilities and things. We know that the first 30 days we're going to be supporting our families. Um, but there's a lot of benefits, and Ann will be working on a lot of these, that they could be getting food stamps and things like that to get started. We do have three of our members here have offered jobs, uh, and, and a couple of them are in the room here, and we thank you for that. Uh, they're starter jobs, but, you know, it's a place to start, and as they start making money, we're going to practice tough love. 
and again, this has been trained, we've, we've been trained by Smyrna's Purse, and we've got another team meeting on Thursday uh, to, uh, we, we've got to document a lot of stuff, so we are going to have a meeting. Uh, we've got a big pile of papers here that we have to document everything we do, every dollar we spend and how much we give. And they want us to help them become self-sufficient. In other words, when the teacher calls from school, we're not going to be the one talking to the teacher. We're going to have the mom talk to the teacher mm -hmm. because they need to learn that, you know, and we'll have translation services. And that's, again, uh, where Shafak and uh, Fridun can help out so much and their whole network. Uh, how many families do you have in your association now? It's 50 or 60? 50, yeah, that's a lot of support. I mean, we figure we're just, you know, uh, and they're anxious and eager to help. And they're associated with the Islamic Center already. Yeah. You know, uh, so, you know, we're really good on that. So uh, the Slack app, and I, I was introduced to Slack by Rachel. Uh, it's called S-L-A-C-K. If you get on your um, Google store or whatever, or what's Apple, just, just type in Slack. And if you want to know what's going on, go to the Slack app because we're going we're gonna to have all of these groups will be broken down and we're going to work in that and we'll have a general group that you can find out generally what's going on. Um, and please pray for our Afghan families and the leaders and all of the volunteers. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, the group team leaders are going to be reaching out and as time goes on, there'll be a lot of duties and things to do. This is going to be a long process. Uh, it's not going to happen. You know, we have to hang in there and do that. So uh, I'm going to call up uh, Fridun and, and uh, Shafak and, and let them uh, kind of go through this. I sent them the uh, uh, PowerPoint project here so they could look it over and kind of get a, a an outline, and, and if you would, hold your questions till the end. I know there's a lot of questions, but we'll just question them to death when we're finished. Sure. So you guys can take over. I started with the, where's Afghanistan, uh, and a little bit about that. As he's coming up, uh, you know that Afghans are not Arabs. I mean, we just, we're, we're pretty ignorant, really, as Americans about the, the, the world. And if you haven't traveled, you know, that could be an insult. You know, th it's, a, it's a country in South Central Asia. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's composed of many different ethnicities that they'll talk about. So you guys can take over, and I'll sit down, and I'll give you this. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, for having us here. My name is Freydun Wahid. I'm one of the, uh, I've lived in Cincinnati for a year and a half. Uh, uh, I previously, I lived in Arizona for, uh, okay. Oh. okay, for 17 years. Uh, the reason I moved to Cincinnati because of my job, uh, currently I'm a resident physician at Jewish hospital. And I have uh, my friend Shafak, uh, yeah. who also lived in Cincinnati. Hello. You can talk out yourself yeah. and introduce. <laughs> so <clears throat> thanks for everyone doing this uh, volunteer job. And my name is Shafak, and I live in Ohio. So since 2016, I'm in Lebanon. So the reason why I'm in the United States is because I work with US Air Force in Afghanistan. And then they helped me with a visa called SIV. So, yes, yeah, so thank you. So actually my story is a little bit different. I myself came as a refugee in the United States in 2004 with my family. So uh, John also wanted to talk uh, about my story a little bit. Uh, that in 2004 when my family and I uh, moved to U.S., it was a pretty difficult transition for all of us because of the language barrier that we had to face, because we had to 
work and support our family financially. And it was a different culture. It was uh, coming to United States, uh, looking from the, uh, we lived in Pakistan, from Pakistan, the idea was like really great. We thought that we will move in United States. We, we didn't have any difficulties. We would provide like all the financial support. All we had to do is like live there. But, um, <coughs> excuse me. But when we moved here, uh, as what we hear was different than what we faced in with the culture, with the language, and then we also had to work like all Americans. And uh, so my first job started as a uh, housekeeping in a housekeeping, houseman in a housekeeping department in a resort because that was my first job. And uh, it was very difficult for me because of lack of communication with, uh, it was hard for me to communicate. It was hard for me to uh, accept the job that I was doing, but uh, later I realized like that's how in America is. We have to work for if we want to have a good life. And that's when I started to go to ESL classes and uh, I just went to school and uh, got my bachelor. Finally, I went to medical school and now I'm a physician here in Cincinnati. So what this taught me that in the United States, everything is possible if we have to work for it. And I had a great support with, from my neighbors, from the volunteers, who were helping refugees, who helped my family. And uh, I'm always grateful to them. And uh, with the re once I moved to Cincinnati, with the recent development in Afghanistan and also influx of refugee, so we, I decided to talk to Shavak and other Afghans here in Cincinnati to establish a new organization to help uh, other Afghans who, recently, who are going to move here in the US, especially in Cincinnati, and also just uh, to provide some sort of uh, communication between Afghans, who ever, who, all the Afghans who are already living here. So there's a quote that uh, if you move to German, uh, Germany or, or uh, uh, Turkey, you cannot be German or Turk. If you move to Japan and live there, you cannot be Japanese. But from any corner of the world, you move to United States, you will become an American. Mm -hmm. And currently, I'm proud that I'm an American. And I am really happy for the opportunity that was given to me to move to United States. And that's why I decided to help my other fellow Afghans who are going to move in Cincinnati. So. That's all that I just wanted to talk about my life. And so, as you all see in the map, Afghanistan is uh, in Southeast Asia. It is not an Arab country because uh, Arabs mostly speak uh, Arabic with, uh, and each country has their own dialect. But in Afghanistan, it is a multi-ethnic country and uh, there are two main languages, one is Pashto and other is Farsi Dari. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. So, and uh, Shafak can talk more about the yeah. Afghans. So, as you see on the map, uh, uh, this is Afghanistan, so it's a, it's not by a state, so it's a republic so have one president and control all the, all the cities. So I wish we know what province we will get those two families, but we don't. So if we, so especially this site like Faryab, Mazar Sharif, Balkh, a little bit on this side, mostly they talk Persian or we call it Dari, D-A-R-I. So. And here is the Kabul, it's like, I can call it, it's like Washington DC place. So from every province, you can find them in Kabul. So they talk Pashto, they Dari, but many offices, they use Pashto and Dari. It's like Canada, they should talk France and English. So, <clears throat> but when you come, if the families come from this side, like Ghazni, Orozgan, or Kandahar, or a little bit this side, they talk 
Pashto. They know Dari, but very, very little. And they like to speak Pashto better because they can understand very well. So again, if we know what province we can get those families, it's easy to find out. So uh, that's all about the map. And so here is the tribe we can found, so Pashtun and Uzbek. So Pashtun has a language, Pashto, but Uzbek has their language, Uzbeki. They're talking like Uzbekistan. Have you heard that country, Uzbekistan? So Hazara, they talk Dari, and most of them talk Persian too. Between Persian and Dari, a little different. Persian is a kind of very old and historical, but Dari is copied from Persian because once the Afghanistan was a big place, it's called Khorasan. So when they separated on the wars, different wars, so they make this Persian and Dari, but it's the same. So Iranian talk like us, we talk like them. Some word is different, so that's all. So Baluchi, they talk Baluchi, but they know Dari well. And Tajik is those who live about these areas, so they, they are mostly Tajik, they talk Persian or Dari, but they don't know how to talk Tajikistan language. So, yeah. Most of them call their immigrant from Tajikistan, but who knows? But that's, and others, we have a little bit of Pashai and some other tribe. They are very small, but they all know Dari or Persian. So, that's all from this map. And So here is the ethnic group. So like 42%. So first of all, last night I talked with John. There is no accurate statistic in Afghanistan happened because of many reasons. One of them is politics. So, so these numbers are correct, but also not correct because there is no database. So based on this, so Pashtun 42 and of course, Tajik 27 and Hazara 9, Uzbek 9, and others are the rest. So Pashto and Dari Persian are the official language, so most of them knows. And religion, so most of, like 80% are Sunni and 19% are Shia. I don't know if this is very correct number, but that's we can find in a website. Others are one person. That's all they have there right now. So just to make yeah. a point here, like there has never been any yeah. uh, credible census in Afghanistan. Yeah. It has never done, and uh, there are even people in Afghanistan who does not even uh, who do not even have an identity card, yeah. and especially those who live in mountain. And also, uh, when we talk about like. Uh, 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 the religion, 99% mm -hmm. of uh, Afghans are Muslims, yeah. and uh, which is like majority are Sunni Muslims, and minority around 20 to 25% are Shias. And Hazaras are m mostly Shia, mm -hmm. but Uzbek, Pashtun, and Tajiks are um, mostly Sunni. Yeah. So, just. I think we have one or two Jewish. They are keeping the United Kingdom graves. I think he is alive. I met him twice. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Yeah. So, do you want to talk about the yeah, uh, so we can. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. I will we go can. on gender or family roles. I'm not so good on first thing. So basically, um, uh, as we know, we are all different. Americans, we might even grow sometimes in one family here in United States. Like I personally am different. My wife might is more conservative than I am. So in Afghanistan, like a country, we have uh, people who are more conservative, who, and there are some uh, less conservative. But majority are, uh, of Afghans are uh, very conservative, and uh, uh, that uh, the females, the women. 
feel more comfortable with women and the men feel more comfortable with men. And one of the things that I was talking to John that uh, one of the issue when the family move here in Lebanon, uh, the woman rather go shopping with another woman. They feel more comfortable talking to a woman and uh, uh, they get along with each other better. And uh, usually uh, we're in United States, a man and woman shake hands or hug uh, each other. In Afghanistan, it's not very common, especially uh, when they don't, uh, like men do not give hug uh, to a stranger man or like somebody who is not their close family member. And uh, also other things, in, uh, but this also depends but as I said, majority are conservative. We, they don't, some of them even don't like for uh, male to shake hand with women. But when it comes to guys, guys uh, hug each other, shake hands so, uh, with each other and also uh, the, with women too. And uh, the Afghans, uh, usually in the United States, we like to have dogs that we can play and have them in our house and sleep with them. Uh, but uh, usually, like majority of Af Af Afghans, they have some distance between uh, the dogs and uh, the uh, human. Uh, it is just the culture that they grow up. Uh, however, uh, uh, you will see once their kids grow up, they will become they become most likely different. They would like to have dogs, or they will integrate to American culture, and then the. Uh, uh, other thing is like in uh, Afghans, uh, they usually uh, like, uh, majority of them, like to keep their uh, uh, shoes like outside of the uh, house and especially when they get into the building, they want to take off their shoes just like a, uh, it's a kind of showing respect and also keeping the house clean like uh, I think most of us here even in Cincinnati we do have that and uh, also the majority are Afghans they would like to have guests and they're very hospitable people they would like to uh, like uh, have a conversation with a stranger they would like to invite people for uh, dinner or tea so uh, you, you might see those who are going to be the volunteer once they meet with them, especially if it is close to noon, they would insist a lot to say, come on, please stay, have lunch with us. It is like uh, some of them get a kind of uh, sad if the person do not stay for lunch because they feel like uh, maybe they don't like us. Maybe it's just like trying to explain them that uh, it, sometimes like, either work issue or some other things that it doesn't mean that they, like if you go and talk to them and it's close to them, it doesn't mean that if you don't stay for lunch, it doesn't mean that you don't like or you don't uh, want to help them. So for them, it's just like trying to be close uh, and uh, it's a kind of uh, also, uh, you, you know, get uh, talk about d different things during lunch or dinner. It's just also showing so especially for people who are going to help them, just showing a little bit of gratitude that they really appreciate all the helps that they are doing for them. And um, uh, so uh, with, uh, it is very common for Afghans that the parents and kids sleep in one uh, room, like uh, they uh, feel more comfortable, especially like uh, they might be like children who are around uh, teenage that sleep with their parents in the same room, but uh, uh, also, there is uh, other thing for uh, kids. Uh, when adults are there, the kids uh, usually stay quiet just to show respect to adults. Uh, so uh, you don't, uh, it's not like uh, they are being harsh to the kids if uh, you go and talk to the kids and uh, try to ask them questions and they don't answer. They always look at their parents, especially to their dad, try to let them answer the question, even if the question is for the kid, but it's just like a kind of they are how the culture is and how they are uh, uh, like uh, grew and it's just the culture that uh, they try to be more respectful to their parents and try and they usually don't uh, try to laugh loud uh, because uh, also a sign of respect because uh, 
in uh, agriculture, it is not very appropriate, not for the kids to be super loud and try to uh, laugh like uh, uh, loud. So uh, those are the, some of the things uh, that uh, uh, like their family dynamic is, and if you want. Yeah, and one small thing uh, here, if maybe some of you have a question, why shoes or dog? not allowed inside the home. So in Afghanistan, they pray five times a day. So when they move to other countries, the mosques are not super close or they don't have time. So they use their carpet to pray. So that's why they feel a little nervous when someone come with shoes. I faced this challenge. My house was all carpet. Just my kitchen was LVT or vinyl. So a guy came to fix the lights. He says, I clean, I use plastic. I said, no, I don't allow that. He says, I don't want to take my shoes. Then I explained to him. He says, oh, now I know. I will take it out. So that's why they are a little nervous if the dog do something on the carpet. Maybe it's not healthy. So they pray and they touch their head on the floor. So that's one of the reasons a little bit make them nervous to be clean everywhere. So, yeah, especially carpets getting very dirty very quick. So, so uh, on gender and family rules. So I'm always worried to say that, but in Afghanistan, men's are a little bit the person who is speak in the house, or they are a little bit active in the house, but when, so it's a little different, like we see the map, so most of people during this two decades or 20 years during this U.S. transition was, they learn a lot of stuff, so equality, men's or women's are equal, but if we face that kind of challenge here with our families that you heard or caseworker heard the man always talk not allowed the women's so that's a little bit why because the family rules are that's how they grow up so always men says okay this is right this is that but maybe we face a better way so that's always not happen so females like if they are married females are always asking question from their men if they can go shopping, they can go to the doctors. This is something family rules always happening there. But again, it's media is good, especially in Afghanistan. So now most of the people respect each other more, but sometimes that's how they grow up, I can say this on the family rule. So can go on dress and social, you may be better on that. So, so the dress, uh, so as I said, with a woman, social, oh, so, social uh, dynamic, so about the social dynamic, you would be a better person to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but the social, as I said, like it's like, a, I just touched a little bit about it with the social uh, dynamics. It's like a men are usually the one who has the final say, and then usually women are quiet, but uh, and they don't usually talk in front of the guests. Or if they go to office, they let men to talk. And but uh, she might uh, feel shy, or sometimes the because uh, uh, the uh, how they grew up in Afghanistan, they don't have much confidence. Usually, they go and whisper to the husband's uh, ear trying to say if it is good and you can talk about it and as also with the kids that I talk and uh, uh, so you uh, as a uh, and other thing is like uh, Afghans uh, do have a, they are proud of their culture they do have a, like a celebrates uh, the new year the new year uh, of uh, Afghans are different than the new year that we have here that it starts at the beginning of January. So usually what uh, uh, in new year in Afghanistan is like usually starts with the spring, which is around March 23rd. And then they do celebrate and they do have like a 
Eids, uh, which is like a Muslim holidays. And usually uh, they try to get together and celebrate uh, together too. And uh, it is usually we will have a big party which everybody comes and celebrates that. And then afterward, uh, it lasts about like a, a week or so mm -hmm. that they go to each other's house. And it's just to, uh, to uh, usually for lunch or dinner and just try to uh, see how things are with uh, uh, other Afghans. And uh, it, uh, uh, with the gender woman, usually uh, it won't be uncommon if you go and see Afghans that the women sit uh, separately yeah. and eat together and men are separate and eat together. So it's the, how they feel more comfortable. And usually in the house, women are the one who takes care of the uh, uh, kitchen and cooking and uh, washing dishes. And uh, Afghan men, unfortunately, would love to just sit on the couch or on, uh, at the table and just eat and that's, uh, get done and just leave everything for the woman to do. Uh, so hopefully it has changed uh, for people who are now in the United States, but uh, you might face this issue. And usually I know it, some, uh, I ha we had a family that uh, uh, one of the volunteers or somebody who were helping tried to tell the uh, uh, woman in the family not to do this and let the husband also. So I think uh, these things will <laughs> not happen overnight, but gradually things will, uh, they will figure it out. So usually uh, if that happens, the men will get really upset. And so it's just like a cultural thing that uh, I wanted to mention uh, uh, that too. And um, uh, so, uh, and also women, they usually, if they are more conservative, they wear hijab, which uh, we call it. It depends. Uh, some are super conservative, where the woman would not even want to come to greet men, uh, and uh, some are like less conservative. Uh, so those with very conservative, they cover like their whole body except just their face. Some uh, of them even try to avoid men. Uh, uh, and uh, just don't feel uh, as a disrespect because if they don't, if the woman in the family does not want to come and uh, say hi to a guest, especially if that is a male. And some are like, uh, just wear a small, uh, ch we call it chadar, uh, which they just see, uh, you can see their face in some of their hair, but they usually come and greet uh, everybody, but they do not uh, shake hand with male. They only shake hands or uh, hug other women. But uh, there are also, which is like a, a minority who just are okay with shaking hands with men. But usually I don't think, it would be very rare for a family who recently moved to United States come and start shaking hands with men. If, uh, uh, except if they grew, as Shafak said, they grew up in Kabul and they are the uh, women who already work in offices or journalists or something. But um, also uh, there, when it comes to uh, cooking and the food, they don't eat uh, any pork. Uh, and also uh, uh, some of the uh, families who are con very conservative, they usually go and buy halal meat, which is like a, the reason, uh, the difference between halal meat and, diff uh, and other meat uh, is because the way they kill the goat or the a lamb or anything, so it's they feel more comfortable to go to uh, like a, to buy halal meat uh, that they uh, eat uh, together. And uh, but uh, when it comes to pork, uh, mostly they don't want uh, any pork. But uh, if they are less conservative, they are okay to eat uh, non-halal meat. But um, with, when it comes to pork, like even those who are not very conservative, uh, they don't eat um, uh, pork. Uh, but uh, with their experience uh, living Afghanistan, unfortunately, it's a sad time in Afghanistan currently with the Taliban gaining power. Uh, a lot of families that who are going to be here, they have left their, even some Afghans who are living here for like many years, they have uh, some connection back home. They have their uncle's family. 
they are always worried about them. And uh, also the experience of uh, uh, the way things uh, went and the experience and the trauma that they faced after Taliban took over Afghanistan and how difficult it was for them to get themselves to the airport and uh, uh, how difficult it was uh, with uh, the things that they face and now they are worried about their family. It is going to be difficult for them, especially now when they find uh, themselves in a country that the culture is different. They cannot speak the language. They are new here. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we are all here for them. And I'm glad that uh, uh, John uh, found us. We are here for them too. When it comes to translation, when it comes to helping them with uh, shopping and everything, we are happy to help them. We are uh, considered as, as a uh, part of your community to help them. We are all here to help them, to help them to have a smooth transition to a new country, to a new culture. And uh, that's one thing is great about America, that we all feel that it is our responsibility to help our neighbor in our community. And we are always proud of that. And um, so they might uh, complain about how things are in Afghanistan. And a lot of them would just uh, right away try to apply for their loved ones who are stuck in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. This would be a challenge for them. And they might uh, always have this uh, 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 concern even after a few months living in the United States. And if you want to. Yes, yeah, so uh, two things. So for the maybe couple weeks, the caseworker who work with them directly, maybe they face, when you bring them some package of food, they will take and read one by one. So be patient. That's, they are searching for like, if the jelly is from cow or from pig, if they will Google it. So that's how they are trying to find out and then accept. So for the dress, so I faced this challenge. So I took the woman to BMV and she don't want to take the cover up. I says, this is the rule in the United States. She says, no. Oh. So luckily, the BMV in Lebanon has, like, most of them are female. So I talk with one of them. I says, maybe you take her to the, your office and take the picture. That's the best solution I can offer. She says, we never done this. So. Maybe the caseworker faced this challenge too. Some offices, they have to take their cover off if we face that type of families, if we face a better choices or families who has more socials, that's much better. So, and that's all on this section. Do you want to add anything about concern or trauma? Yeah, so since August, I work, because the team I work with, we had like 25 others Afghan who work with us. They, we always told them, you can apply for the program, come out. They says, no, we live in Afghanistan. So when August, those planes happen, they are just, oh my God, we were left behind here. So since that, I work with them one by one, sometimes I wake up until one, one o'clock, so to, because that side of ocean, the time is different. So they keep texting you. So of course, that's hard for them. And that experience is super hard, especially, I have my family, my father, my mother. So that's hard for them to, and uh, the way United States left Afghanistan, many Afghans are super scared and now we face the winter, they don't have food, some of the families, because there is no jobs. And they lost their families. I know that maybe 1,000 kids are in United States, but their parents are in Afghanistan. And that's super hard for them 
we always pray for them to be safe and one day their families join with them and that's all I and uh, our organization, our association does uh, work with uh, Immigration and uh, Refugee Law Center. Yeah. It is a group of lawyers who are volunteer and uh, do help uh, with the paperwork and uh, those who apply for their loved one. Unfortunately, the waiting time is like really long. Uh, US has brought a lot of Afghans that are in the camp and they are trying to figure out how to resettle them in the United States. And there are also some Afghans that uh, they uh, uh, evacuate them from Afghanistan and living in Qatar, Albany, and all those. So it is going to be a challenge uh, for uh, anyone who comes here and try to bring their loved one, their parents, or their siblings. It is going to take a long. So hopefully we can all be patient with them, and hopefully they can one day uh, join their uh, family in the United States. And we also have a lot of uh, members here who have been living in the United States for 20 years whose uh, siblings and uh, parents are in Afghanistan. And we are still helping, trying with the Immigration and Refugee Law Center to bring their family in the United States. And today we also invite one of the Afghans who live in Westchester. He is a businessman. And he is here about 20 years. He's right there. <laughs> so he helped a lot of new incomers during since August. So once it's named business, so he has more time. So he can help easy. So I will share his contact with John if something needed. He is a very good person to reach out. And he's really helpful. And, and he is. Yeah. He, him and his wife together, they do. And his uh, wife is also uh, help, uh, does uh, help, especially women uh, who are uh, who, uh, the woman in the family. So yeah. she does go with the woman in the family to do shopping for them, uh, to help them with the grocery, clothes, and everything. So actually, we did uh, talk about like what to uh, do, and, do don't. and don't, yeah. <laughs> especially like the family dynamic and how women and uh, men uh, in Afghan culture is like. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I cannot say it's something good or bad, but this is how they grew up, and they are kind of proud of their culture. There are some of them would just uh, like their kids to grow up. Uh, with the same culture as we are all, like despite uh, we are all American, we all have our own culture and uh, we just like uh, being respectful to each other and uh, to each other's belief and religion. And um, other one thing that I miss, like a lot of Afghans, they don't drink alcohol. Uh, and uh, so women are usually more conservative. At the beginning, they don't drink alcohol, but after a while, usually men will start <laughs> drinking, and the female are not happy, and that will sometimes cause an issue in the family. But uh, you know, we are human; we usually change yeah. over time. So, but uh, they don't appreciate when people ask them, "Let's," especially the woman, if the another person asks the husband, "Let's go to the bar or let's have a drink." Usually, the, it's the female who get upset. Uh, and, uh, but uh, if they start drinking, usually it's men first and yeah. women hardly, unless the kids grow up and then they will start drinking. So, And about uh, tobacco or a smoking? It's tobacco. Yeah, 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 I want a helpful thing I want to share. So we smoke in Afghanistan like cigarette. The, Many different companies make them. But we smoke some other things, which is lawful there. And it's grow up everywhere without anybody touch them. Especially I have a big yard. There was some. So when they come here, if they are a kind of families they come from, or they are farmer, they don't have too much information, maybe it's good to tell them everything is not allowed to smoke here. Of course. 
the cigarette is one of them, it's okay, but others are maybe, in Ohio, as far as I know, some of them are not allowed to do so. So that's a good thing to share with them, especially if they are smokers. So that's, I faced, they don't have enough information. They say, oh, here is democracy, everything is good to smoke. No, 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 no. <laughs> here is also some laws you should follow and to a smoke especially. Just uh, one more point in that, uh, in uh, Afghanistan, like where I grew up and I've seen uh, when uh, I went in Afghanistan in 2011 and 2012, mm -hmm. uh, it is very common for usually, you know, it's men who are usually put everybody in trouble. So uh, usually <laughs> men, they smoke, but women, they don't usually smoke. But the unfortunate thing is like they all sit in one room and smoke cigarette and the kids are also there, the, everybody else is there. But in the United States, it's not allowed. They, we have a smoke detector. If you want to smoke, just go outside and have a cigarette. So they, one of the things that uh, hopefully we can tell them that, hey, it's not allowed to smoke inside the building or inside the room where kids are and there's a smoke detector. Yeah. Maybe like, uh, because my experience when I first moved in an apartment, my mom was cooking something and suddenly some alarm went off and we were like running back and forth and trying to figure out what is going on. So these are the small things, but uh, so suddenly like our, the owner of apartment, people start complaining, the neighbors came out and then they called the manager of the apartment complex, they came and we had no idea what was going on. But it was just like we were cooking something that uh, there was some smoke and the smoke detector went off. So for them, it's just an example, like uh, just uh, to let them know that smoke is, uh, smoking is not allowed inside the building and also about educating them about some smoke detector, and all those things and how to uh, turn that off or open the windows and those things. No, yeah. So, so about like, as I said, we don't have to, uh, everybody is not the same. We are all different. We don't have to assume like, uh, well, uh, if one Afghan is one way, everybody else is the other way. And, uh, so, but uh, it's all depends, but uh, what we are talking about, like generally what is common and uh, how the family dynamic is in Afghanistan. And it's based on uh, religious teaching and also the cultural. So those are the thing. There might be uh, one thing I said that we, about the woman that they might wear a uh, hijab like or chadar covering their hair, but it does, don't assume that they, they are very conservative and they don't like to socialize and come uh, to the uh, dinner or lunch or can, do not want to go out and people are different. So once, uh, it, once uh, you interact with them, uh, you will uh, uh, have a better understanding of the uh, specific individual or uh, a specific family that we are going to have. And uh, so I think uh, any question, we can take some question. I think John can help us with those <laughs> answers if we don't know. <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, so we do have, a, we can give our phone number. You guys can always call and uh, we can translate over the phone. Oh, I meant like an app. Huh? So, so that would be my question. Yeah, we're playing on, uh, okay. I'm not sure, yeah. making a phone call. We'll have a lot of numbers uh, and then we can call and just put it on a speakerphone. Yeah. And that's, you know, we've talked about that. That's going to be the easiest way. Mm. And. We'll oh. have a lot of, a lot of your uh, wives or people that are. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. So there are also female uh, members who are volunteer, and they are. Uh, if you need in-person translation, so they are happy. If you set a time, they will come to whatever you guys want and translate for you. So if they are very conservative, so they can feel more comfortable to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have some legal forms that the adults will need to sign. 
will the woman be okay with signing her form? Yes, usually that should not be a problem. But uh, as I said, if it's like a very conservative family, they would just have to ask uh, the, their husband's permission. But they don't have any issue to sign. But, sorry, but just the, the husband might ask a lot of questions about the form. What is it and what is it? So usually a woman would just put their head down and sign, but the husband is the one who might ask a lot of questions. Yes, sorry. Yes. So I am here with my wife and now three kids, but when I was here, two kids. So yes, ESOL classes down the street, that side. So I told John when he told me the plan, I talk with the teachers over there. Like my wife, when, he, when she came here, she doesn't know maybe, she know like one or two word, hi, how are you, that's all. But in 30 days, she got all the items. So she understand very well, she talk good, and she was comfortable to talk. So ESL class is the best place for them because they are, each class has 35 to 40 people, now less, now it's 15 because of COVID, because they need to make space like six feet. So they have multicultural, but I think only my wife was from Afghanistan since that time, so we'll be three family now. So that's good thing, so they can communicate in class. They will teach them English. The way, for example, if they are talking Dari, they have a method, they have a rule, how to teach them to be easier. So Pashto, talking Pashto is harder than Persian because Pashto is like French. You need to move your tongue a lot. So when a Pashto speaker come to speak English, you will hear a lot of noises. So that's why they have a method to teach them how easier they can understand. So yes, that side of the road, they have very good classes, very good teacher. <clears throat> and the good thing is no fee. As far as they have their status like refugee or green card holder, it's completely free. <coughs> and once they found that he or she got enough English, they will help them to find a job. And once they find she is ready to take an exam, GED exam, some Afghans, they don't have a, a school degrees or high school degrees. So most of the job they are asking for GED. So once they find out, okay, she is enough to get all the everything, she will send them to uh, Warren County Department over by, if I'm not wrong, by, uh, I forgot, huh? No, 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 it's uh, Norwood, North Broadway, sorry. If you go North Broadway, there will be a Warren County Cosmetology Department, but they have a separate department for GED. So they will teach them for like 60 days how to go over those exams, and then they will get their GED too. Again, no fee. And they have an opportunity if, let's say, the, women's are very, the women who follow the men's are very open, they like to learn something, like cosmetology stuff. As soon as their income is good, they will free offer them a class to learn something and get a job, if they like. So yes, for English class, it's easy. So it's close here. I think their apartments are close to. Yeah, okay. we have contact. It's Warren County Community Service. And okay. one of our friends at United Methodist uh, is connected with there. She's not here tonight. Uh, okay. There's so much going on behind the scenes, I could go on all night, but they're, yeah. they're mining up all these things. Some of the things, though, we don't know because we don't know. <coughs>
Yeah. Okay. So one thing I wanted to add uh, regarding women, like, uh, you know, in, uh, I had this experience. When women wear hijab or scarf, uh, as usually uh, people think that, well, maybe she doesn't know English, but if they don't wear hijab, they're more liberal. Yes. They assume that she knows English. So I get this a lot with some women that uh, they go to office and try to talk. The first thing they ask them, okay, so can you speak English? Or do you want me to bring you an interpreter? They get really offended. And I had this with my wife. She's like, I know English, but why everybody keep asking me everywhere I go? Yes. It's just like, a, as we said, don't assume that they don't know English. Usually if they don't know English, you will, after just talking a couple uh, seconds or two minutes to them, you know that that person needs interpreter. It's just not based on like how they dress up, whether they know English or not. So there are some women who are like physicians who wear hijab, in, but uh, they do have some sort of uh, difficulty and some of them get really offended uh, by just being asked that. So, yes. So based on my experience, like when uh, there were a few volunteers, like two or three volunteers who used to help us, by the end of the first month, they already knew like about 10 words. And because uh, it's usually they feel more comfortable, especially with children and uh, children and the woman, the family get very close and attached to a female volunteer and try to teach them how to say specific words different food, how to pronounce it, and those things. So by gradually, uh, I have still some uh, of the uh, people that who used to help us, they still, when they, we meet, especially as John says, Salaam Alaikum, and Khuda Hafiz, like, hello, bye, how are you? Those words, still they, speak, they say in Farsi, just to sort of uh, feel that they are close to us. It's like a special connection that we are building over time. Yeah, so our group, one, one of uh, uh, our, uh, our members that help uh, newly arrived refugees, we help them to get an instruction permit in their language, and then if they need to go to... It, it just depends uh, on their need. If they are both uh, going to work, if, uh, and also the, it depends on their financial, get two cars. So it all depends on the family and what kind of job they are going to do and how many children they have if they have to. to uh, and also the, with the, if they need, if the man is uh, always busy and the woman has to drive and do shopping. You, we have, uh, my experience, sometimes at the beginning, they usually try to get only one car. If they both know how to drive, usually the woman will uh, take the husband to drop off to work and they do the grocery and all the uh, other things and then go and pick them up. Uh, so it all depends on the family. Yes, uh, so as I said, mostly Afghans who come in the United States. Uh, they, in Afghanistan, we have a kameez shalwar that the men wear, mm -hmm. but once they move to the United States, I've never seen anyone in, Not in Ohio, Ohio to wear it. In, yeah. yeah. in women, when it comes to women, they do wear uh, jeans and pants, yeah. but sometimes in a special occasion when there is uh, some, like a culture gathering, they do wear the traditional clothes that they wear. So they do accept uh, the donation when it comes to clothes and uh, anything else. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Will the children, young children play boys and girls together? And if they go up to the Y, will the children participate in swimming classes? Will they wear bathing suits? So 
usually for the children, uh, uh, up to till they go to high school, they uh, uh, boys and girls do play together, and uh, they do go to swimming classes or anything. But uh, as far as uh, with male, they don't usually have any problem to wear short. But uh, for female and girls, once they go to certain age, usually uh, age is 10, and uh, sometimes yeah. it depends to families, sometimes like even higher, they usually don't allow for female to wear shorts. Uh, uh, and uh, so they try uh, to, women usually cover themselves more than men. So for men, it's not, it's, uh, not common you go to a house where woman is all wearing with her job and everything and man is walking with shorts so uh, for them usually they don't but usually for men also like uh, they uh, tr usually don't wear uh, shorts but if they wear for them it, it's not a big deal as for us with women yeah children yes children as i said like uh, for for Guys, for boys, it's fine. For girls, it's till certain age. Till like age of nine, usually the cutoff. Okay. There are some uh, families that can uh, go higher, and but some like, but nine is usually the age where they think that the woman should dress properly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes? So uh, we do have a WhatsApp group. Uh, any family who comes and get the phone, we add them to a group. If in case of emergency, usually they leave a message in that group and we, one of us definitely uh, call them during the emergency. So uh, it is my recent experience. Um, as I said, I used to live in Tucson, Arizona. We uh, had the similar uh, group and WhatsApp group that uh, uh, they just uh, re resettled an immigrant family in uh, Arizona, were close to the airport where the security situation is not good. And a thief, uh, a three thief came overnight around like two o'clock in the morning to their house, and they all shouting, and uh, the thief also started shouting, and they keep living. They suddenly like, hey, thieves are here. We are so scared. We try to move to United States that thinking it's very safe and now look at what is happening here. And then uh, so somebody had to call 911 and, uh, for them and while they were on the phone and that's how they translated for them. No, no, it was just like as soon as they left them. So it's just a matter of text like or just leaving a word. It's like, I don't know how it I, how familiar you are with WhatsApp. It's just like, hey, I need help, and somebody would just call immediately. And also, uh, as I learned, so once they came before they came, maybe me and John can put them a, like a draft okay. sheet. So the, if they don't know English, let's say. So actually, United States Air Force and Army made a very, very default forms that the easy words like, I need help, this happened, or how to communicate very quickly if nobody is available. So maybe I can print it and give it to you, like a booklet, so we can leave it in their house. That's something maybe help them if nobody, let's say nobody answered the WhatsApp group, right?
we'll actually be training the family on those kind of things. The first day when they arrive, we will do a checklist with them, how to lock the door. That's the smoke detector. Uh, things that could really go south quick. 911. Uh, they are taking cultural training on the military bases also. Okay. Good. Uh, there are, they, they've taken three months of that. Uh, so they're going to be familiar with that. And, and there is a, a wall plaque, and I, I'd like to see yours too, yeah. that we'll put in the home. And most of them should have cell phones. If not, we'll get them one. Yeah. And if it's a matter of calling 911, you know how that works. If it's a silent 911, they'll come. But, yeah, we'll, we'll show them. I mean, you know, it, again, we don't know if they'll speak English or not, but enough. I need help. You know, just something like that uh, right away. Since they are new, we can leave them one emergency number. At least they can call that family. Right. For example, call me anytime. We're going to try to connect them real yeah. fast with, with the association members and, and have their, they, I mean, they've got a really neat member. This is just so great uh, for us. It's going to help us uh, help them Yeah. Yeah. Right. We don't want that to happen. But right. The good thing is, you know, we can always sleep on the side. Yeah. But maybe Rick would do something. He knows more than we do. They've been through a lot more sleep. Oh, this yes. is going to be like. I guarantee. Yeah. Yes, much so. better. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, much better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. About they keep thinking we're Cincinnati, and I said we're not. We're not. You know, I kept trying to explain where we are, and I said we don't want to go to Cincinnati. We stay out of Cincinnati. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it, this is a very friendly place. It's quiet. You know, it's a good place, and they didn't understand that the mosque is not in Cincinnati. It's it's right over Westchester. Yes. So. Yeah, that, and that's what this sheet I was showing you. There is so much we have to do with walking them through things. And and I really think that, you know, plopping them within the association, so to speak, is, is really going to help. Yeah, at least maybe for 10 days or 15 days, we can go there with you every yeah. day or every day an hour or two hours. I live in Lebanon, but Dr. Freidun and Emma live a little far, like 20 minutes. So. Yeah, he lives. Uh, yeah. Freidun, Dr. What you call you, doctor, right? Yes. Right. And that's funny. You cannot. Like, <laughs> my first name. Yeah, he, he lives right on. Uh, you can have 42 where Shaw Parker's farm is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I live like 10 minutes away from here, yeah. uh, so it's like an animal side community. Uh, mm -hmm. But we have actually, um, and we're going to walk the team through this, uh, we have a 24-hour a plan, a 48-hour plan, a 5-day plan, 10-day plan. I mean, this is, you know, we're going to be doing stuff methodically. And we know everybody wants to meet them, and it's hard, but we don't. We can't overwhelm the family. It's going to be stopping by. We're going to assign our team members. Like, if you've got this day, like, Ann will have Tuesday to do all the health stuff. Yeah. And then uh, Shabbat can, can have Wednesday for them to go grocery shopping. Sure. And then Thursday, we're going to try to do one thing a day. You know, and the kids have to be in school within two weeks. So. We've got a social worker in the Lebanon schools. In fact, we thought his daughter and my granddaughter were first grade together, but their classrooms are next to each other. Just a wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, Fridun's uh, daughter's name is the same as my grand other granddaughter's name. Ezra. And she's Ezra. Yeah. In English and both from 
She is always. Sorry, she wanted to talk. So he was just talking about Sindaro, and I thought of all of us wanting to go visit them and introduce ourselves. Is there going to be some sort of training where how they can come to the appropriate approach? Like you said, no hand shaking. And at what point in time do they have? Do we have right away, like a fringe? Or do we like wait two months until we have established a relationship? Is there going to be some sort of, do the women need to wear like a scarf or something? So for a woman, you don't have to wear a scarf or hijab. Usually women, uh, they are very receptive of women. You women should feel more comfortable to go to their place uh, than men because uh, uh, the way things are, you, cause a lot of time men does not have a problem shaking hand with women, uh, but uh, a hug, uh, that is a, a little bit different. They don't usually hug, but shaking hand, men mostly do shake hand with women. Right. We have never faced uh, any no. Afghans who are uncomfortable shaking hand with a woman because Afghanistan is very male prominent country that everything was about men. So they have more freedom and uh, that <laughs> <laughs> woman that I they- I worry to say that. <laughs> yeah, but, but this is like the, just like uh, the reality. I wish it was not that. But a woman, like for guys, uh, uh, usually it is different. So they have to be very like cautious of uh, is looking at them to, to figure out whether women you, uh, want to shake hands or not. Usually the first uh, few months, uh, the rule of thumb is don't shake hands with women if you are male and yes. uh, don't give uh, them hug. You can shake hands with guys as a male and even if you want, you can hug them. They don't have any issue with that. But uh, with a woman, they can uh, shake hand with other Afghan women. They can give them hug. With a male, they can shake hand. Usually they don't have any problem. You don't have to wear a hijab or all those uh, uh, things that an Afghan woman wear. Yes. Um, connection. Um, I'm a University of Arizona graduate. Oh, okay. <laughs> Usually, uh, I don't think that would be an issue if you are a woman, especially for women, again, uh, they don't have any issue. You can always ask them to come to their. If there's just a male in the family and does not have a spouse or a daughter, for them to invite an Afghan uh, family and woman to come to their house, there's a kind of, they might feel at the beginning when they are not too close, a kind of, uh, they might feel awkward, but for women, they can always ask them even in the first week to come. And they really like it to go to someone else's house and uh, also look at uh, uh, their way of living and they try, uh, they want to see uh, how life is in the United States. Uh, we were all very excited when we first moved to United States, uh, having an American friend and going to their house. Yeah. But, but if we have pets, dogs, is that an issue? Uh, Dogs, yes, but cats, no. Yeah, usually they don't try to touch or like play with dogs. So th that's a good point. Yeah. Huh? Horse, yeah, they, <laughs> Afghans love horses. Uh, it's a country that they love to. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I didn't know that you have a horse inside your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lebanon, there is a lot of horses. Yeah. We're going to try to let these guys go. Yeah. yeah. And we get asked questions a lot, but you want to take one or two more? Yeah, sure. And, and I just add something real quick to that. I'm interested in the education of the children. Could, would they be allowed to have tutors outside of school? Or do oh. Have translators or interpreters in the schools for them? So they would love to have tutor in the house, especially for kids. Uh, I know uh, Emil, uh, who 
was here, first move in Cincinnati, they did have a tutor who would go to their house and uh, teach uh, children English, math. And uh, my younger siblings, uh, we ha they had tutors who would come to their house and uh, teach them. I'm not sure about the school. Like, yeah, uh, I want to add this. So Bowman School offer a free class to children under 18 if they are coming from a different country. So, because my kids did that too, so I talk with them also to ask if, if that program is available. They says yes. Don't worry, as soon as they come, we will take them to the schools. Half day, they will take the English as a second language. Half day, they are regular with other kids. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. We've identified two of our church members that uh, okay. one of them sitting in the back here that can tutor. And the school does, is prepared. Okay. To help with that, so, yeah. Um, just, did you have a question? No, nah, okay. Uh, th just real quick, we, again, we don't know when and, and who we're going to get. Okay. But when we go to the, it'll probably be an airport, uh, they're all a military base. There's 56,000 uh, Afghans out there. That, they're probably down to about half of that now. And uh, we will pick them up and bring them to their home. One's on Calderwood, behind Kroger, up in that subdivision. One's right here on High Street. And then we'll have a meal ready for them. And we'll ask you guys to help with that. Sure. <laughs> Your wives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because we're not sure what to do yet. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, we, we can prepare some food yeah. for them when they yeah. come the first stage. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. And that would be good for them yeah, to okay. see other Afghans. And uh, Shafak doesn't know it yet, but he'll be going with us to translate sure. that day. Sure. <laughs> and uh, we, <laughs> we got I'm all these here. dudes working. Yes. Yeah. And, and I've got a commercial for him, too, real quick. Okay. Flooring. You need flooring, he's the man. He, yes, he uh, designs flooring. I'm an interior designer. If you need any idea of how to build something very fashionable in your house <laughs> or get rid of asbestos, get safer in your home, just give me a call. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so we'll have a meal and then we'll have a checklist of safety things we go through. And then we'll leave them alone and the next day we won't. I mean, they'll have phone numbers to call. They'll have that sheet, you know, if anything goes. We just want them to get settled. And then the third day, we'll have somebody go for, you know, we'll start lining up our visits. Okay. And as far as visits, uh, they'll get to know certain people. And I think they'll become close with some of our team members and some of you who they're working with. It'll be very comfortable. Yeah. But we would like to try to have a dinner. We talk about this a little yeah. bit. Maybe in about two weeks, once they're here, have a dinner here to welcome them. Just, you know, the whole church. And, uh, you know, I don't know if that's going to be too overwhelming or not, but maybe we could think about something like that. But we don't want to rush it, you know. We, we don't want to overwhelm them. So. Bless you. Bless you. No. Uh, we, we, we we drove by the homes, and uh, a lot of them is in a, is in a, uh, a busy neighborhood. Lots of lots of families. Yeah. And it's got a lot of, uh, of that age group that would have families that. And any advice for integration of, of the children and families into? I mean, there's just a lot of people right around there. And it seems to me that if we could start off very positively, it'd be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So Box neighborhood is very similar to Calderwood. Yes. Our first family will go there. And it's likely we'll have the second family a little later. Okay. We, we, we thought we might get them together, but I think we're going to get them maybe a week apart or okay. they'll be staggered. But That's much easier. That from yeah. where you live. <laughs> we can. Yes, actually. When I move here, I live in an apartment, have four neighbors. So my friend said, this is United States. They need to come and know you before you. So yes, 
It depends, but they are mostly open to introduce with some other neighbors. Is this an apartment, John, or it's a like? It's a, it's a um, duplex. So one neighbor? One house, and it's connected. Okay. It, it's attached. So it's much Another better. House. So in Afghanistan, if they live in Kabul, it's more same. Apartment everywhere. Like 40 people live in one apartment. So yes, they are very easy. They, they, they are easy to get along with other neighbors. If, for example, you walk by or knock the door, hi, my name is John, I'm happy to have you here. They, are, they have no problem, as yeah. far as I know. But it depends, like, from where they come yeah. or, yeah. And we'll be in those homes uh, furnishing and whatever in the next few days. I mean, we're literally getting ready to do that. Okay. We, we, we'll have the keys in probably tomorrow. Okay. So we can actually go in. Okay. okay. But I want to okay. thank Shafak and uh, Fridun for being here. Um, just, just like I said, our friendship is gr just in, in a quick two or three weeks. Yes. You know, we have met and talked and so we're blue in the face about all the different things. And, uh, and again, you know all the coffee shops now in Lebanon. All right. And, uh, we Some classic one. But I wanted to thank our again our team members yeah. and our team leaders and and uh, Rachel. Uh, how are they going to know where the sign of genius is? Do you know that yet, or where to look? Um, so I will send it out. Um, I'll send it to our membership to our leader team, and then I will also send it to Jerry to distribute to the church. And, okay. Um, it's church wise. Uh, anyone who's here who's not from LGT, if you want to come see me after this, I can always get your information. Yeah. And Online, yeah. Hammer. Yeah. Rachel is our communication person, and uh, she designs how we get all the word out. And uh, she'll have the information for anybody not with LPC uh, on how to get a hold of that sign of genius. We did put one out earlier, but this one will be more specific uh, on actual items our team members have put together that we need. The first thing, of course, we're working on is transportation and housing and furnishing the house. And uh, you know, we still need a, like a washer and dryer for both homes. Uh, furniture's coming in, but we don't want a bunch of junk just dumped. You know, we, we're going to have, some, we want a dresser, a chair, or, you know, things like that, and clothing. So see Rachel. She'll, she'll be able to hook you up with that. So thanks for coming, and uh, would you like to close in a prayer? Just, uh, sorry, I just want to add one thing. I want to thank uh, John, Peter, and each and every one of you and uh, for all the work that you are doing and uh, it's just uh, it just gives us hope that uh, we are all human that we are trying to help our others who are especially in the time of need and uh, i'm very glad that shafak introduced me to john and uh, john thank you for everything you are doing yeah, for the welcome. new family and thanks everyone this is yeah. a neat prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you for this meeting. Thank you for Shabbat and Friday and their friends, the association that will be working with us. We pray for our family. We have no idea who they are uh, and when they will be here, but we think that we'll be soon. Uh, we thank you for our volunteers and those willing to be here to learn about the Afghan culture. And it's one small world that we live in, God, under your uh, divine power. We thank you again for this opportunity. And again, we pray for the success of this project. So it's in these things we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Son, amen. Amen.